people are joining us right now. For those of you who have already gotten on, I'd like to welcome you to looking ahead to fall of 2021. We're going to give another minute or so for all the participants to get on board, and then we will get started. We've got a lot to talk about. Okay, don't go away yet. People are still logging on. We're glad you joined us though. Um, this is a virtual information se session for current Lehigh students and parents looking ahead to fall of 2021. We have a good group of panelists who are gonna be talking to us today, each of them giving us a perspective on what the fall will look like. We will be answering as many questions as we can. Um, don't promise to get to all of them, but we will try our best to get to those that um, have been asked a lot or come up frequently. So let me, um, I know people are still logging on, but I'll go ahead and introduce our, our panelists for today. So we have our provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, Nathan Urban. Also joining us is Rick Hall, our vice president of student life from the Health and Wellness Center. We have the Executive Director, David Rubenstein, and our Medical Director, Sarah Stevens, plus our Director of Housing and Dining, Ozzie Briner. I'm Chris Halliday, Associate Vice President for Human Resources at Lehigh University, and I will be moderating today's panel. Um, we um, are excited to have everybody here because I guess one of the things we do know, even though information keeps changing, every day um, and we're doing our best to keep up with it. I think we know that last fall was not a normal year and this fall may not be normal either, but I think it's safe to say it won't look like last fall if we can do anything about that. So we're gonna talk about all the changes that have happened, some that are still happening, um, including the fact that by the time we start uh, our fall semester, we're gonna have a new president on campus. Uh, lots of things going on. So what I'm going to do is give each of our panelists a chance to um, give us their perspective. But before we do that, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you will notice that down at the bottom, you have a Q&A button. If, as we go through the session, if you have questions, please put them in there. Uh, we will be keeping monitoring that as well as we can. And for the time that we have, we will answer as many of those as we can. Uh, we are going to focus a lot of our discussion on questions that were submitted previously, particularly those that were submitted a number of times by a number of different people. You'll also see down there uh, uh, on the bottom of your screen a button called live transcript with a closed caption. Um, you can toggle the caption on and off depending on your preference by clicking on that button. And finally, one last item is that this session will be recorded. So if you have to leave early and you wanna catch whatever you might've missed, or if you know someone who wasn't able to log on today and they wanna see it, if you go to our COVID information center on our uh, portal website, this will be logged there shortly after we complete today's session. I don't want you to miss anything there. All right, well, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and get started because we do have a lot to talk about. Um, how about we start out with each of you giving us, you know, just a couple of minutes on how you see the fall of 2021 looking for us, for our students, um, you know, particularly for people who haven't been to campus yet, but also for those who are coming back perhaps after not having had a normal experience last year. Let's start with the provost. Nathan, can I put you on the spot? Great. Thanks, Chris. So, uh, I certainly agree with you that I think next year, next fall is going to look a lot closer to normal than what we experienced last fall or even this spring. And I'll say that you know, this spring, um, as the semesters moved on, we've pushed to make things more and more normal. We now have uh, you know, gatherings of up to 75 people outside, up to 25 people inside, over and above the, the in-person classes. And so we are, based on guidance, based on our sort of our 
their best um, medical advice that we're getting, we've been moving to be sort of more and more open, more and more back to normal. Although you know, we still have people wearing masks on campus, et cetera. So it's not completely back to normal. For the fall, we are planning uh, on the academic side. We're planning to have classes, um, the vast majority of classes in person at full density in classrooms. I think that the um, students have, have uh, wanted that and faculty have wanted to be back in the classroom. And I think that with vaccination rollout, we will have the opportunity to, to be there, uh, to be there in person uh, with uh, in-person classes at, at you know, normal capacity in the room. Um, we will have a small number of classes that are being offered uh, fully remotely. Most of these are uh, targeted at, for example, international students who cannot come to campus. Um, but the vast majority of classes will be uh, in-person, live, instructor, in the room, students in the room. Uh, we're also uh, looking for other kinds of academic activities. Students who are participating in undergraduate research and um, a, a wide variety of programs that Lehigh typically offers to students, educational and, and other programs. We're looking to have these um, be activities that people can participate in in person. Um, offices will typically be staffed in person so that if you need to see uh, the departmental coordinator about registering all those kinds of things, we're expecting that these will be um, activities that people will engage in in person. Um, we think that this is, uh, you know, so this is the way in which we're moving things to be, you know, not, again, not 100% back to normal that we can anticipate but certainly much, much closer to the way things were you know, back in fall of 2019, for example. Um, as uh, will be mentioned uh, in terms of residence halls, we are uh, looking to have you know, full capacity in residence halls, students living in doubles, um, uh, et cetera. I think that the, the you know, likelihood is that students sitting next to each other in a class will be masked, uh, that they're, you know, that will be something that will be a part of the health and safety protocols um, as we're going forward. Um, but uh, that is something that we've talked to students about and, and addressed with students. Uh, they're pretty comfortable with that aspect of it as long as we can you know, really be there uh, in person uh, with each other uh, and have uh, you know, those kinds of interactions happening in the classroom, outside the classroom, all, you know, all across campus. Okay. That's a good perspective. All right, Rick Hall, I'm gonna put you on the spot next. What, does, what do you think the student experience is gonna look like for this coming fall? Thanks, Chris. And, and like the provost said, we're anticipating not, it, it won't be identical to fall of 2019, but very similar in that, and you're gonna hear from Ozzy, we're gonna have our, our residence halls full. We will have on-campus programs. Uh, orientation will be in person uh, in this fall for the class of 25 and, and, and we will be having orientation activities that are specific to the class of 24. Uh, we do we know that they did not have a full uh, orientation experience and their first year at Lehigh was a different experience. So there will be some programming dedicated to that to that class. Uh, things like getting their orientation leaders uh, to get those groups together in person, because we know that they had limited in-person interaction this academic year, if any at all. Uh, so there will be opportunities for them to be engaged in person as a class or with members of their class uh, as much as they want to be. There's, there's going to be a concerted effort to make sure that students are aware of uh, involvement opportunities, student organizations. We have you know, well over a couple hundred student organizations on campus. And we saw some of the membership and some of the activities of those uh, student organizations uh, take a dip this year because folks were sort of zoomed out and they didn't want to have uh, the bulk of their experiences uh, virtual. So we, we absolutely look forward to in-person programs and uh, revitalization of a lot of our student organizations uh, come fall semester. Uh, we look forward to resuming uh, some of our campus traditions, you know, our traditional uh, Lehigh Lafayette week, 
fall sports, spectator sports. We anticipate students will be able to attend and we encourage students to attend and support their, their peers in person, uh, in the stands and, and, and on the courts. Those things will resume with, uh, with orientation. And we look at orientation as, as a, the real starting point. August 2nd, uh, our staffs uh, will be back on campus. We, we will be an in-person operation. Some of our student affairs folks have already begun returning to campus. And, but by, by that first week in August, we, we fully anticipate that we will all be here. Part of the orientation or even the reorientation for sophomores is making sure that students are familiar with offices that provide resources for students on campus. We know that students know where the dining halls are, where the health and wellness center is, they know where Taylor Gym is, but offices uh, like financial aid or like the lounge spaces on the second floor of the university center, the M room, the pride center, the center for, for gender, uh, gender, gender equity. Those are important spaces also because in those spaces, students, like I said, they, they receive services from staff, but they also get to just hang out and congregate. And that's how we build community on campus. So there will be an effort to reintroduce those students. And I know that some of the first year students, they've been really good about getting out and exploring campus on their own. I see them in some of the, the spaces in Lambertson Hall and Williams Hall and the University Center. And we, we absolutely encourage that. Uh, but we, again, we'll make a concerted effort in the fall to make sure that our students are aware of our, our indoor spaces. And, and, and the last thing I'll say is we're also going to take full advantage of the lessons that we've learned over the last year and a half. We know that some, some, there are some interactions, some virtual interactions that the students absolutely enjoy. And so we'll continue some of those interactions, but the focus will absolutely be on in-person interactions, including some of our outdoor programming. We have those tents up on campus, and as I understand it, they're going to remain in place for a while. We want to optimize our outdoor spaces as long as the weather is going to allow in the fall. And we will be providing some opportunities for students to, to really get together in person in and around campus. Right. Sounds like a lot going on. So one of the main experiences that students have at Lehigh is with their housing and their dining, right? What's that experience gonna be like? So Ozzy Briner, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in on that. What's it gonna look like in, in dining and housing this year? Well, well I can just tell you, uh, I've been at Lehigh, next year will be my 31st year. And this time of the year, I'm always exhausted because uh, it's been a long year. But this year, I'm more energized than ever, looking forward to a great fall and a great return of somewhat normalcy, hopefully normalcy. Uh, what's our housing going to look like? Our capacities are going to be uh, a typical capacity. So bedrooms will be filled with, we'll have singles, we'll have doubles, we'll have triple bedrooms uh, that are big enough to fit three people. Uh, our lounges uh, won't, our, our Sofas won't be taped off, you know, tables hopefully won't be taped off. Lounges, study rooms, and game rooms uh, will be used, uh, will be able to be used. Uh, we have some fitness rooms in our, our uh, residential complexes that will also be available for use. Um, our housing selection processes for our returning students have been completed last week. So all sophomores, juniors, and seniors will know if you're living on campus where you're going to live. Uh, and that includes our, our fraternities and sororities, which will be occupied again, which is uh, just wonderful news for us. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, a sad thing to see those buildings so empty this year. So it, it's, it'll be great to have them all back. So if there's anyone out there who has not yet uh, contracted with us and wants to live on campus, you can certainly do that through our office. Um, you know, we have a wait list for housing available. So just come to our, our website and we can take care of that. Uh, first years uh, will be beginning their housing journey uh, as early as May 20th of this month when our housing contract opens for first years. And they'll fill that out uh, and they'll have an opportunity to uh, search for potential roommates through a, a, an app called My College Roomie. Which is, which is a, a fun thing to do, search for someone who you're compatible with. Um, Move-in in August, um, you know, we are, we learned some lessons last year in that, you know, previous years, uh, 
you know, we had a lot of people arrive at the same time and there were lines uh, and COVID forced us to have block scheduling for arrival. So uh, we believe we'll have some uh, sign up times for an extended move in process so that uh, you know, parents and, and family members can move their sons and daughters into their residence halls without, uh, without you know, being, waiting in long lines to do so. So classes begin on the 20, or 23rd of August. So the move-in uh, will begin as early as the previous Monday, which is the 16th of August, when first years primarily will be moving in uh, orientation begins for the first years on Thursday, um, the 19th of August. So they'll all be moved in by then. And then upperclassmen will have the opportunity to move into their fraternities, sororities, and residence halls. Um, uh, uh, dining, you know, one of the, the real sad things about this year uh, that COVID created was the need to, to eliminate in-person dining for some of the year. Uh, Thankfully, that's back at the end of this semester, but uh, we're looking forward to having uh, our all you care to eat restaurants, our dining halls open without uh, you know, capacity limits. So a group of 10 hallmates can come and grab a table and sit and hopefully go through a, uh, a buffet line that they can serve themselves. Uh, this year, everything has been served for them. Uh, not that I know anything about buffet lines. <laughs> it's a little joke. I hope I know about it. Uh, but uh, that certainly students prefer that and hopefully we'll be able to allow that to happen. Uh, all of our uh, retail locations from the Hawk's Nest to food trucks to uh, the grind down at uh, FML will be open and all of our uh, dining operations will more than likely go back to original 2019 hours, which most of those were open for extended periods of time. We cut back on the hours during uh, this COVID academic year. So uh, housing and dining, we're just looking for more community, more interaction, and uh, a more exciting experience for everyone involved. Great. Great. A lot of information there. And I think from looking at the questions that are coming in, we'll probably dive back into that um, here a little bit later in this program. Um, but right now I'm going to I'm going to reach over to David and Sarah. So we have just spent more than a year being dictated to around this pandemic, which hasn't been easy on anybody. I know the wellness center has been running so fast the entire time. What can you tell us as far as your best predictions you know, about the coming year? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting, just as um, you would think that um, we were feeling exhausted at this point, but as Ozzy was saying earlier, uh, myself and I think the Health and Wellness Center team in general has been feeling more energized. And why are we feeling more energized? Well, the trends over the course of the last eight weeks have really been strong in terms of low positivity all the way around in terms of surveillance testing under 1% and certainly in our symptomatic testing symptomatic students who are symptomatic or close contacts, all of those positivity rates have been exceptionally low. And that and, and what that has meant for the health and wellness center is that we're beginning to return to more traditional health and wellness services in our health and wellness center. And so we begin to, we're hopeful that these trends over the course of the last eight weeks or so, eight to nine to 10 weeks, um, will carry themselves over into the summer and into the fall semester. So similar to Ozzy's point, I think we're uh, energized by um, what we hope will unfold in the fall semester, which is uh, as Dr. Howe was pointing out, all the, the wonderful activities that can occur on campus and um, and academically, of course, the um, you know all the enriched learning that can take place. So, in the Health and Wellness Center, if you've never been to campus before, though, the Health and Wellness Center is located in Johnson Hall, which is in the close to the center of campus. We operate pretty much like a primary care ambulatory care clinic. We have physicians, nurse practitioners, and nurses that staff 
uh, the health and wellness center, our hours of operation Monday through Friday. And I'm speaking for those of you that are coming in that are new, uh, a couple of words on that. So we're open Monday through Friday, eight to 4.30. And, uh, and then of course we have a clinician that's on call uh, overnight. So a student can talk to a healthcare provider overnight if there's something happening. And of course, if you're not aware, our counseling center is also located in Johnson Hall as well. Having psychologists to provide individual therapy as well as group therapy, crisis services, and also they have an uh, overnight on-call crisis service as well. Probably one of the most exciting things that's happening in the fall is that we're opening up a brand new floor in Johnson Hall that is going to become part of our health and wellness center. Uh, traditionally, we've been in uh, We've operated off of the third floor over the course of this past year to mitigate risk. We opened up another clinic in Tremblay Park, and that was in where we could mitigate risk through seeing students with COVID-like symptoms uh, in Johnson Hall on the third floor, and then students with more traditional concerns and non-COVID-like symptoms over in Tremblay. And so the exciting thing is that in uh, the very end of July is when a uh, brand new floor will open up in Johnson Hall and we'll be bringing our, all of our staff back over to Johnson Hall in which we on the third floor will continue to see students with non, I'm sorry, with COVID-like symptoms or infectious kinds of processes that are going on. And on the second floor, we'll see students for a more routish, uh, routine care, routine health care. Um, so, there's a lot of uh, exciting things that are happening uh, over the course of this summer in preparation for the fall. And certainly um, our staff, as Chris was pointing out, a lot of energy throughout the entire semester in terms of managing students who were symptomatic, who were positive, who were close contact, who needed quarantine. And of course, as the process continues to unfold, taking a look at um, what the CDC is saying and what the Pennsylvania Department of Health is saying, what the Bethlehem Health Bureau, guidance from all of those areas as we continue to move forward and uh, make plans for the fall. As I'm sure you're aware, and we'll talk about this more in this, um, in this informational session, so um, students are required to be vaccinated. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Dr. Stevens? Yeah, so like everybody says, you know, we're hoping and planning to be moving more towards previous normal, though I would say just like in the world around us, what that new normal looks like, I think is still going to be a little bit different. Certainly in the health center, we are going to continue to be able to assess and evaluate uh, safely students who have symptoms that could be consistent with COVID. And so rapid um, you know, assessment and testing is very important for uh, preventing um, you know, outbreak and spread. So that's gonna continue to be important. Um, it is also going to be, I, I think we're gonna have more of our traditional primary care. Many parts of this year, we've been really very consumed with managing COVID and COVID cases. And I think with vaccination, with lower uh, positivity rates in the local community and in the nation, you know, that's gonna be less and less. I feel like I'm often the one on many of these calls who says the pandemic won't be over. Um, so it's not gonna be completely in the rear view mirror, but I think it's gonna be at a, at a lower amount. Um, but it's still gonna be there and we still need to be able to safely you know, manage that. Um, we do provide, as uh, Dr. Rubenstein said, a lot of very traditional college health related services. So we continued and we have continued to do SDI testing, contraceptive counseling and management. We also manage and uh, provide immunizations for a variety of conditions. Um, we see a lot of routine things, rashes, abdominal pain, you know, uh, fell off the skateboard, twisted their ankle, we all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, we will continue to do that. And I think an interesting thing for us, which we have commented on many times in the health center, is that this year we had no influenza, none. And to put that in context, 
we are actually a surveillance site for the Pennsylvania Department of Health for influenza. So we do send out samples to the state that are tested for flu. And our COVID testing as of January has included flu testing and we have had zero cases of flu. So it's fascinating to me because everybody worried in the fall, appropriately so, how is the fall and winter gonna be if we had the double whammy of COVID and flu? Um, and the nation didn't have that double whammy and we didn't. Um, so I'm hoping that some of the mitigation efforts that really helped that will continue next year. Um, also interestingly, we didn't see, we've had the last couple of years, we've had an adenovirus outbreak. We had hand, foot and mouth disease a couple of times. We didn't have any of that this year, um, which again, I, I just find fascinating. Um, I'm not sure which is worse. Um, a whole lot of hand, foot and mouth disease, because I'll tell you the students were miserable with that, but it was not a potentially life-threatening uh, condition. But anyway, um, so we are excited about our new space. I think it's gonna help us be more efficient as students kind of move through our process. Um, and I'm sure we'll get back more to the vaccine issue. Yeah, and uh, just to add on that, one of the things that the Health and Wellness Center will continue to do, which was enormously helpful, is we continue to provide rapid COVID testing in our uh, in, in Johnson 3 in the third floor, and that allows us to get the results of um, someone test results within an hour, and that's very helpful in being able to knowing whether or not we need to isolate a student or, or not, or, or treat something different. And that will, those services will continue in the fall and next year as well, as well as testing uh, students who are close contact. So those uh, testing capacities for uh, symptomatic students as well as close contact will continue, of course, in the Health and Wellness Center in the fall. Thank you. Great. A lot of cause for optimism, a lot of good indicators in there. Um, so, so you mentioned the vaccine a few times. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out a question now, uh, open it up to the entire uh, panel. Um, and, and this one's gonna be a question from me. So before, uh, before we start answering some of the questions that we quote, I'm gonna read you a couple here, at least a couple of snippets from the questions um, and then pose my question for you. So. One uh, comment that came in is, why is Lehigh requiring an experimental vaccine for a healthy student? Why are we requiring a health, a, a experimental vaccine for healthy students? And then on the other side of that spectrum, just a few questions away from that was, COVID shots should be mandatory for everyone. There should be no exceptions. In fact, can I require that my roommate get vaccinated? So before you answer either of those questions, my question is, how do you walk a line between two strong opinions um, and pretty much opposed opinions such as that when you're setting some um, you know, decisions for Lehigh University? Who wants to take on that one? So, so maybe I'll take the first uh, stab at that. So you know, this has been one of the, the biggest uh, difficulties throughout this whole pandemic is that we have uh, within the country, you know, across the world, there's a wide range of opinions about what it is that we should be doing. I mean, on, on the vaccination issue in particular, we have received, um, you know, since uh, two weeks ago or so that we said that we would be requiring vaccination for all students um, with exceptions for medical and religious exemptions. Um, we've received some emails saying, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, that this is the only way that um, my, my students um, can feel safe or that I can feel safe on campus. And we received some emails from people saying that that's the, you know, the worst thing we could possibly do. In these, uh, with, with respect to these issues, you know, we try to, uh, to look at what science and medicine is telling us. We consult with experts. We talk to you know, infectious disease experts. We talk to our own Health and Wellness Center staff. Um, you know, we look at what other institutions are doing. We look at uh, you know, what makes the most sense to us based on evidence and based on data. Um, in this case, uh, with respect to vaccines, we had um, you know, a lot of students get COVID uh, over, over the last year. 
Um, we, you know, looking across the country and across the world, uh, we're hopeful that we're out of the woods in terms of the worst of the, the pandemic, um, but we don't know that. And so we think that it is important to have, uh, have students get vaccinated um, with the exceptions that we've described. We think that that's the path forward for getting us to as close to normal a campus experience as possible. Um, you know, we, we have had students uh, you know, who felt like they were worried about leaving their dorm room um, because of when there was an outbreak on campus and we had you know, a 5% or even higher positivity rate uh, from our surveillance testing. We had students telling us that um, you know, nobody should care because you know, they got COVID and it wasn't that bad for them. You know, there's clearly, for any of these issues, a wide range of, of experiences and, and of opinions. And we are trying to do what we think, based on the best science, the best evidence, the best evidence you know, makes sense for our campus. With respect to this fall, we are trying to create an environment where we can be you know, as close to, to quote unquote normal as possible. We can, we can be together. We can have you know, in-person classes, in-person inter interactions, in-person social activities. We can have our students living together in the way that uh, you know, they had anticipated uh, when they you know, first uh, decided to come to Lehigh. Uh, so so we're, we think that the best way that we can get to that is by requiring vaccination understanding that there are some people for whom uh, it's not going to be possible to be, to be vaccinated for, for medical and, and religious reasons. And so, so that's sort of the approach that we're taking. Um, and you know, as we go forward, we will continue to look at the best available guidance. You know, there's changing guidance you know, week to week on, on mask wearing, on you know, a year ago we were all scrubbing down surfaces and now it seems like surfaces are you know, not the problem. And we should be paying attention to um, uh, you know, how many air changes are in a room. So we are you know, looking at the best available evidence and trying to adapt what we do based on that. I think from a health perspective, to that point, I think since the pandemic began, we really prioritized, we made that decision that we were going to prioritize health and wellness and that the decisions that we made we're going to we're going to come from that place first and one of the things that we're aware of that we know the vaccine reduces the risk of infection we know the vaccine reduces the risk of serious illness we know the vaccine reduces the risk of potential fatality and we know the vaccine increases the likelihood of herd immunity and what does all that mean well it means that that the campus has a far likelihood of being a safer and healthier place. And not just for the campus, but for, for the surrounding community as well. And it allows, um, it increases the health and safety of the campus and allows the, the campus to open up to a degree, which also has its own impact on health and wellness and safety in terms of social wellness and well-being and emotional connectivity and all of those. So it's, um, it's a pretty dimensional process in terms of making decisions in respect to requiring the vaccine and with, with of course, the exemption for uh, medical or religious reasons. Dr. Stevens? Yeah, and I think to your point, uh, it, it is important to bear in mind that these are not experimental vaccines. These vaccines have gone through really a, a rigorous um, scientific clinical trial um, process. Um, so that's one important thing. And the other is, I think it's important to think about this in the larger context of vaccine preventable illnesses. Colleges and universities have really, a, a, and schools uh, have a long history of requiring immunizations to protect the health of the students, the faculty and staff, the community. Um, and it's been very important. I mean, there's, there's illnesses that, you know, the sort of joke in the medical world is that if somebody with that illness came to see us, we wouldn't know what it looks like because we haven't seen it because it's been, you know, eliminated essentially by uh, vaccines. And some of these illnesses, it's important to remember that these very effective vaccines 
can not only protect the person who gets the vaccine, but often the reason you're vaccinating that person is because of who might be ill secondarily. So one example is rubella. So you wanna have mothers vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella because congenital rubella is a, can be a devastating uh, congenital infection. So you could argue, well, I'm vaccinating the mother, but they're not the problem, if you will. It's the baby. Yeah, that's why we do that. And um, I had another, oh, and the influenza, I think, is an interesting one to compare to this because influenza, which I think we have a very widely accepted influenza vaccination um, you know, program, if you will, in the country, that vaccine is actually most years in the 40 to 50% range of effectiveness, meaning it's very good at preventing really severe illness, but we still have a lot of flu. Um, if you look at the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines, they, are, they exceed um, 95 plus percent in preventing death and very severe illness. Um, so I think it is important to keep some of those things in context. And I do believe that part of vaccinating, you know, I can tell you at the health center, as soon as the vaccines were approved, it was not required among our staff, but pretty much everybody was right there over our holiday break, kind of first in line to get the vaccination because we see, we know, we know how bad COVID can be. And so the vaccination is really important. Um, um, Chris, you mentioned roommates. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's really important for roommates to talk, specifically our uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors who already know who their roommates are gonna be. Most of them selected spaces with people because they wanted to live with them. Uh, a conversation should absolutely occur among those roommates and, and find out what the comfort level is uh, among the, that group. And if someone is not comfortable for whatever reason, we do have a, a, a housing wait list that, uh, you know, as vacancies open up elsewhere, we could look into potential move. Uh, on the first year side, uh, we, I mentioned my colleague Rumi is an app that's a, it's a terrific app that enables you to find a roommate kind of on your own. Um, you know, you fill out uh, the, in the app, you fill out information about the, your hobbies, interests, likes, personalities, et cetera. And, and it, it provides you with a list of people who would be comparable and good, potentially good roommates for you. And, and you make contact with them. And again, converse with them, have, have discussion with them. And if uh, a, uh, being a vaccinated roommate is important, you know, try to find someone who agrees with that and agree to be roommates together. You know, we as the as a university will not be making assignments uh, based upon vaccination status. So, if it's important to you, uh, my college roomie on the first year is would be the way to go and, and reach out to people to look for for those with like beliefs. Yeah, that, so it sounds like COVID nineteen is going to continue to play a big part in a lot of important aspects of life at at, at Lehigh in 2021. One of the most important is going to be the academics, right? So a number of questions are coming up about that. Nathan, you had mentioned that the majority of instruction will happen in person. We'll be able to do that this year. What will that really look like for, for large classes? Will, will there be online options? If I'm not still not comfortable coming to campus, will I have some hybrid options? What would that, what, what can you tell me? Yes, so the, so the vast majority of classes will be taught um, in person. And you know, we, we do have a small number of faculty who for health reasons will not be able to be on campus. And we're working through what that means. In some cases, um, you know, we're finding different instructors for those, for those classes, for example, or someone to team teach um, that class, et cetera. Um, and that's still a bit of a work in progress. And I know that there were some instructors that, that contacted students saying that they were um, 
uh, you know, contemplating their class being online. And we're working through that in a case-by-case -case basis. And if that's something that is a concern to you, I would encourage you to email um, provost at lehigh.edu uh, so that we can you know, work out you know, details of those particular cases. Um, the vast majority of classes will be in person. Um, there are many instructors, you know, we've learned a lot during COVID. There are many instructors who will be recording classes. I think this will occur in part, it depends on the technology that's available in the room, but it will occur in some of our larger classes in particular. Um, not so that students don't have to show up because we want students to be there in person. Uh, instructors want students to be there in person. Um, but rather, many students have learned that this is something that can, can enhance their learning if they can watch parts of the lecture again. If there's something that, that wasn't clear the first time, uh, they, can, they can view it again. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, that, and that is something, you know, maybe in, in advance of an exam or something like that. That's something that we uh, want to make available in many cases. That's, I can't say that that's going to be uniformly available just because we don't always have that, you know, not every classroom is, is equipped to do that effectively, but that's going to be um, something that is, you know, much, much more common than it's been in the past. Um, you know, in-person classes also means in-person exams for the most part. Um, uh, you know, obviously we've always had some classes where there are take-home exams and other kinds of you know, assessment mechanisms, but, but the, the, the majority of exams have been certainly done in person. We, we do have some students who have um, or are, are contemplating requesting accommodations. We have students who are uh, immunocompromised, um, who despite the fact that we are requiring vaccination are concerned about coming to campus because they're concerned about being out in the world um, during COVID. Um, there's a process through our, our um, disability resource services um, to request those kinds of accommodations. Um, and when students um, uh, need that kind of accommodation, you know, we're gonna work with them on a case-by-case -case basis, in many cases on a class-by-class -class basis to figure out, is this a class that, you know, is there, what are the options that are available? Um, you know, is there, do we need to provide access to this particular class um, online or remotely for that student? Um, do we need, is there a way in which the, the classroom can be sort of managed in a way um, so that the student can be there in person? Uh, a lot of those decisions are going to you know, depend on very much the specifics of, this, of the situation, of the circumstance. So it will be important for students to, to reach out and to be in touch with um, DRS um, about that, hopefully sooner rather than later, just so that we have time to work through this, whether that means making sure that there's you know, technology for, for recording in a particular classroom, or whether we have a conversation with the instructor about the way in which that class is being taught. So, so I would encourage anyone who has um, concerns about, about being part of uh, an in-person class to, to um, contact disability services um, you know, as soon as, as, soon as, uh, as the issue comes up. Um, the other thing I would say is that in talking to students over the last couple of weeks, one issue that's been raised is that there are students who are um, you know, uncertain as to whether they, they, in some sense, learned as much as they should have um, in a particular class. Uh, you know, learning was different uh, than, than it has been previously. Some students you know, found it more difficult to pay attention in Zoom classes. Um, some students found it easier to pay attention, fewer distractions. Um, recognizing this, we're looking for ways to provide additional academic resources for students. That might be additional tutoring in some cases, additional opportunities for students to um, to you know, catch up or learn things that they may have missed previously. Um, and so that's something that will be you know, broadly available for students as we move forward into the fall. Recognizing that you know, some students um, you know, may, may be looking for more of that than others. Uh, you know, this is going to be a work in progress. And, and you know, I sent an email to all faculty uh, maybe a week or so ago, you know, raising this issue, making sure that faculty are aware that they need to um, work with students to sort of reintroduce them to the classroom, reintroduce them to the material that um, is going to be, you know, the expectations that are gonna be part of their class going forward. Um, we, I think we need to, to all recognize that this trans, the transition back, no matter how excited we are about it, no matter how um, 
uh, how much we want it to, to happen. It's not going to be without you know, occasional uh, you know, hiccups, uh, you know, some things that are unexpected, um, and you know, for some people, a certain level of anxiety about being back in person um, with, with lots of other people. Yeah, and there's a lot of questions coming in about that, trying to get their arms around, you know, how much will we we'd be allowed to do? Some of the questions I'm looking at say, if if I do have or ask for a medical exemption because uh, or religious exemption because of um, from the vaccine, am I even am I allowed to come on campus? Am I allowed to participate in some of these in-person activities? Yeah, so certainly. Um, you know, are currently, and this is similar to what we've done, as, as Dr. Stevens mentioned and Dr. Rubenstein mentioned, uh, you know, this, requiring the COVID vaccine, this is not the first vaccine we've ever required. Uh, in fact, we have a number of vaccines that we've required for, for some years. Um, the current uh, approach that we're taking is, is similar to what we've done in the past, which is that um, students who have um, a need for an exemption, will be allowed to come on campus. They'll be allowed to participate um, up until the point where we determined that that, you know, hopefully we won't, but that determined that that would be um, you know, unwise or unsafe. So in the case of you know, meningitis vaccine, for example, which we require, um, students who request an exemption or need a medical exemption for that, for example, um, can come, live in the dorms, but if there's an outbreak in the dorms, then um, they, they can't stay in the dorms. They, they have to, to leave. And, I, and David or Sarah can probably provide more details on, on that. But that's the approach that we're taking, is that it is a requirement. And um, we will allow students to come to campus, to be in class, to engage in, in um, you know, all the activities that we, we deem to be you know, safe for them, given um, given the situation, given the level of COVID in the environment, given the level of COVID on campus, um, given you know, the prevalence um, and concerns about it. David or Sarah, do you wanna? Um, yeah, sure, to yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure, certainly if students have requested and have an approved medical <clears throat> and religious exemption, they're not restricted from activities on our campus. We asked, of course, though, that they you know, would participate in mitigation of risk strategies and be mindful of that. Um, to keep themselves and other people safe. And, uh, and as Dr. Urban mentioned, if we did have an outbreak on our campus, then and that might mean um, needing to leave campus for the safety of themselves, the health of themselves or others. But I think that the main point in all of this is that uh, even if a student is not vaccinated, they wouldn't be restricted from activities on campus, but we would ask that they would participate in those very health promoting behaviors to keep themselves and other people safe. Sir? Yeah, I don't think I have a lot of, to add to that, but I think the context is separating out up front. No, people are not going to be excluded from any activity. Um, but similarly, if we had a mumps outbreak, I mean, if we can remember back to 2019 in Pennsylvania, I think there were three universities who had significant mumps outbreaks. And that requires, uh, those mumps outbreak required, um, you know, booster MMR, and those had their own significant impacts on the university. So, you know, similarly, if there's an outbreak, we will have to be able to manage that. Um, Chris, I was just going to add that, in addition, and, and Dr. Rubenstein referred to uh, risk mit mitigation steps. We, the entire community is going to be asked to help in, in this effort. And this is faculty, staff, and students. Uh, as, I, as I said, the workforce, an entire workforce is going to be returning in August. And members of the workforce are asking these exact same questions about their own health and safety and the, and the health and safety of students. So one thing to be mindful of, there, there will still be masks seen and worn, especially inside of our spaces on campus. Now, of course, outside is going to be different. I've seen some questions about restrictions on whether or not there are going to be restrictions on, on uh, campus activities and behaviors as few as possible. Club sports, intramural sports, uh, use of the ta of Taylor Gym—all of those things are going to resume. But then there's also 
direct one and one one on one or small group interactions that are going to occur in some of our spaces. And even though uh, students or, or staffs and their minds might be perfectly healthy or safe, I, I know without question that, for instance, that I do have some staff members who are in some way immunocompromised or they have a close family relative li living with them that is. And it will be um, up to the community to help each other out. There are going to be occasions when someone sitting behind a desk is going to ask or even insist that someone entering that office uh, wear a mask and maintain a, a safe distance from them. And by us all uh, helping in this endeavor, that, that is what's going to keep the campus open and operating, uh, again, as close to what we had in fall of 20, 2019 as possible. So I'll ask this one the way that I see it coming up. If we're going to have the vast majority of people vaccinated. Um, first of all, wh why do we need masks if everyone's, almost everyone's vaccinated? And might there be a time where the numbers become so low that we don't need that anymore? So, so I'll jump in. I mean, yeah, I, I will say that I, that I hope so. I, I hope that uh, the, the level of COVID the rate of infection in the community and on campus, it goes so low that um, we, we can almost forget about COVID. Um, I don't anticipate that that's where we'll be at the beginning of the fall semester. Um, and, and even if we were, even if it looked very positive at the beginning of the fall semester, when we bring lots of people together from all over the country and all over the world, um, doesn't seem like the time to um, you know, put away all of our mitigation strategies. So we are I, in the you know, early part of the fall semester, you know, people arriving from all over the place, that is a time of, of you know, greater risk. And so we'll certainly have um, you know, masking in place uh, as, a, as a requirement um, in classes, in indoor spaces. You know, there, was a, there was a question that was asked, um, what what won't be you know back to normal or something along those lines and and um, you know a couple of things that that come to mind that I see as you know areas of biggest risk you know um, large large indoor gatherings where people are, are you know, densely packed together if we have uh, a capacity crowd in the Zollner Art Center for a um, for a, a musical performance uh, you know a thousand people or so in one room. Um, and we're going to have masks on. Uh, you know, that's that's you know, something that I can you know, almost certainly guarantee. Um, the so there will be some things like that where we see that, you know, evidence of highest risk. Where I think we will continue to put in place mitigation strategies. We we are going to you know, for for people who are not vaccinated, we're going to continue um, uh, surveillance testing. Um, that's something that will be different uh, you know, in the fall, right? We've already sort of moved to the point where we are not doing surveillance testing for, for people who are fully vaccinated. We have about 750 or 800 or so students who are already fully vaccinated. Um, and I think that the, the, you know, the impression that I get from talking to students is that you know, 80 plus percent of students will be vaccinated without you know, any um, any concerns uh, that's you know, without any sort of difficulty. Um, you know, they're intending to be vaccinated. We, we need to you know, make sure that it's easy and convenient for people to get vaccinated. Uh, and I think we'll achieve that. And 80% is a great number. That's in terms of being able to achieve a, a, a level of activity and a sort of a, you know, level of safety on campus. Um, you know, I'd be really happy if we were 80, 85% vaccinated. Um, you know, the, the governor of the state of Pennsylvania today put out a 70% vaccination target uh, for sort of making some modifications here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, you know, so I hopefully we'll be able to get there um, and we will be able to then have you know, more, more activities, more things in person, more things you know, back to normal. And that will make a difference. So I think I heard Rick, I heard you say that, you know, the gym's going to be back open and things like that. Um, what about athletics? What about athletic events? Yes, well, that, and 
that is the plan to have a full resumption of our scholarship athletics. And I, I know the question came up about Lehigh Lafayette and I saw that the football schedule is already up for, for the fall. And so that's November 20th. There's all, there was also some questions about family weekend and those dates will be announced, I'm sure before orientation even, but I, 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 was, I was doing some surfing and I, I don't see that those dates are announced yet. But full resumption of athletics, of intramural sports, of club sports, uh, all of those activities that you know, fill students time outside of the classroom, uh, we do look to resume. And so you're planning on a parent's weekend as well? Maybe don't, don't know when yet, but... Not sure when, but yes, that, that we would have a, a family weekend, correct. What about fraternities and sororities? Will they be resuming as normal? They will resume. Uh, there, I saw a question come up about uh, Greek Rush. And we, are, we do refer, def, deferred recruitment. So that happens in the spring semester, the beginning of the spring semester. There is a smaller recruitment that happens in the fall, but the, the larger recruitment will happen in the spring. Uh, as he can speak to, to the return to housing for uh, fraternity houses for our traditional residence halls, but we, we don't anticipate that the fraternities and sororities will be wholesale helping with move-in this year. Uh, move-in will be more similar to fall of 20 than fall of 2019. And I'm, I'm not sure that those houses would need to open any, any earlier, but there will be a scheduled, uh, scheduled dates for them to come back and move their belongings into the houses. Ozzy? Yeah, uh, uh, there've been several questions about moving dates. Um, things are not completely finalized. I, I can tell you that it'll occur the week of August 16th through the week of the 20, or through the Sunday, the 22nd, uh, sometime in there. Freshmen coming in first, upperclassmen towards the later part of the week. Fraternities and sororities would be moving in because they're not helping with the move program, uh, probably more than likely Friday, Saturday, Sunday of that week. Uh, there was a question about uh, athlete, ath athletic teams moving in early, uh, certainly if they're fall athletic teams um, and they require an early move in, their coaches will be communicating that out and we will you know, have them move in uh, earlier than the 16th based upon their needs. So pay more, uh, listen to your coaches and they'll be communicating that information to you. Okay. Yeah, Nathan, you, you um, that the majority of students seem to be um, not have much hesitancy about getting the vaccine. Um, why then isn't it, if it's required of students, why isn't it required of all faculty and staff? I believe the language used right now is strongly encouraged. Why not required? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. We certainly thought about um, that. I mean, a couple of, of factors are, are important in our minds. One is, I mean, if we're looking at what happened over the last year, um, you know, we had 1,600 and some odd COVID cases among students. Um, we had a, a, a very small number of COVID cases among faculty and staff. Um, and so the, the risk there was simply much, much lower. We had, we had little or no evidence that there was any transmission that occurred based on on-campus activities. Uh, and we have a, you know, more of a responsibility for the health and wellness of students. That's why we have a health and wellness center, which is specifically devoted to students. Um, we don't have a health and wellness center devoted to faculty and staff. Um, and so we see us as a university having, having more of a sense of responsibility for student health. Um, we um, you know, recognize that, there we, that we, we want um, as many faculty and staff to be vaccinated as possible. Um, I'm fully vaccinated. Um, I know that the, the, the vast majority of the people, I mean, I'm sitting here in my office and uh, many of the people in my office are already fully vaccinated. This is something that we are you know, pushing and promoting and trying to make as easy as possible. But the, the reality is that the level of risk um, that we've seen over the past year has been much, much higher um, for students to get COVID than uh, among faculty and staff. And so in terms of trying to control any potential of outbreak. We have students you know, who are living with us, living in our residence halls, you know, spending the vast majority of time on campus. 
And that is something that, uh, therefore, we have you know, a responsibility that I think we need to take seriously. Yeah. So do we know, uh, maybe this is a question for Sarah or David, um, will there be booster shots required or a vaccine every year for something like this? So that's a good question. I wouldn't call it the million dollar question, but it's a good one that I don't think is quite determined yet. Whether, uh, you know, there is data that at least the Pfizer, I think, has gone out to about six months and there appears to be very good immunity, um, but it's not clear whether there needs to be a booster. I believe uh, Moderna is already working on uh, like a third boost that includes um, kind of enhanced coverage for one of the variants. Um, so I do think the word is out on that. Um, you know, we don't, I don't think it's known yet. It would not surprise me if there will need to be boosters. I mean, these are viruses that as they replicate, they mutate. Um, and just kind of like flu does, you know, you need a booster every year because the, the types are just a little bit different. Um, so the word is out on that. <clears throat> we'll see. All right, great. Yeah, still lots to be learned there. Um, some questions coming in about um, registering for classes. And maybe can you give us any advice about registering for classes, um, knowing or not knowing yet what's going to be remote or what lectures will be, will, will be required to attend in person, things like that. When I'm looking at the, um, the catalog, any advice on how I should approach that? So, so as of right now, all classes, the only classes that are sort of scheduled to be offered remotely are classes that are designated as, I think, I think we're calling them international classes. Um, uh, those are the only classes without a substantial substantive in-person, undergraduate classes, I should say, substantial um, uh, in-person um, component. But we do have quite a number of graduate classes that were done online and fully remote before the pandemic and will continue sort of in that way, that's um, sort of a different, uh, a different story. It's also true that we have summer classes, which are 100% online. And again, that predates the pandemic. But in terms of the fall, um, all, all classes will have a you know, substantial substantive in-person in component, you know, more or less um, in-person, um, with the exception of these classes that that may not even be visible in the registration system that are being called um, international track, I believe is the terminology that we're using. Those are, again, we have students who we anticipate will not be able to be here physically in person because of visa issues and travel restrictions and other things. And so we are trying to create some special sections of courses often offered at a, an unusual time because if there's students from India, students from China, who um, may need to access these classes, we're trying to offer them at a time which would be, um, which would make sense given their time zone rather than make sense given our time zone. Um, but with the exception of those classes, which will be remote, 100% remote, the vast majority of classes should be um, in person. Okay. And will movement around campus be open? What about you know, card swipe access? How are we approaching that? Yeah, so, so right now, on campus, anybody with a Lehigh ID can get into many buildings, the dorm, uh, academic buildings, et cetera. Um, we'll, over the summer, we will transition to a system where buildings are open, um, you know, sort of normal business hours. Um, for some hours into the evening, it'll be swipe card access for any anyone with a Lehigh ID. And, um, and then you know, very late at night, building access will be restricted, um, maybe at, you know, after 11 or something like that. Um, that is, um, that's the, that will be the, that's the plan for the situation um, in the fall. So buildings will be open, you know, just open to the public, if you will, during normal business hours. And did you answer about the hawk walk? Do we still have to do that hawk walk? <laughs> uh, TBD, I, I, everyone's uh, favorite app on their phone is the hawk watch app for, for parents who may not be familiar, this is our symptom checker, have you recently traveled, have you recently been exposed to somebody with COVID um, uh, system where we have to check in every day. Uh, and I will attest to the fact that if on days when I've forgotten, I can't get into my own building. 
Uh, it takes about five minutes, uh, maybe as much as 10 minutes uh, to, to fill out the app and then get building access restored. Um, uh, we have not made any decision as to you know, whether or when that will um, you know, continue. So, uh, Great. So um, you talked a little bit about surveillance testing, that there, there still will be surveillance testing on campus, but probably not nearly to the, to the extent that we've been doing it this semester. Um, what about, how will we handle when we get a positive? You know, will there be uh, close contact? Will there be contact tracing when someone's symptomatic? How are we going to deal with that? Yeah, so in the Health and Wellness Center, we'll continue with the, um, well, both testing of symptomatic students. So that's the rapid testing that we're doing in the Health and Wellness Center, as well as close contact. We'll maintain the close contact testing that we're doing, as well as we have a contact tracing team that um, we grew significantly over the course of this past year and um, and will continue on uh, all of those services will continue to be operating over the summer as well, actually, and will continue into the fall in terms of um, <clears throat> reaching out and contact tracing with um, students who are positive. And then, of course, that team, the Health and Wellness Center contact tracing team, not only is connecting with those students who are positive or checking in with them, but also um, is working closely with the housing and dining team in terms of uh, isolation, housing, and uh, dining, et cetera. So, yeah. What can you, and I realize you're, you're kind of guessing here because it, things change quickly in this realm, but what about travel? Um, traveling to campus, visitors, family, um, do we know how we're going to accept them or, or will we make them go through the off watch app and things to come on campus in the fall. You know, I can take a little stab at that one. And I think it's a little hard to predict to an extent what that's going to look like three or four months from now. A lot of that is going to be informed by what um, the positivity rates and the case rates are in the areas where our students are coming from. So in the United States and in other countries, um, the role that variants might play in that, and certainly what is the state and the CDC uh, guidance. And in the state's um, case, sometimes it's not just guidance, it's this is what's required. So we kind of have to put all that together um, and monitor that. And as we've all seen, that much of this can change really very quickly. And we have to you know, be prepared that it might not, I mean, I could sit here and say right now, you know, the current guidance is that you wouldn't need to quarantine from any travel within the United States, whether you're vaccinated or not. But whether I can say that still in, you know, August, I can't predict. So I, I guess my point is, I think people need to be flexible and to know that this might change. Yeah, it's only changed about 25 times so far throughout this year, right? And we've all adapted to that. Yeah, yeah it's not more than 25. <laughs> so, um, so let me just reiterate what I heard you say, make sure I got it right. If I'm traveling within the United States, I won't be expected to quarantine upon reaching the... Not at this point, not under current... Not as of today at 6 p.m., no. What if, you know, this last semester I maybe had the experience quarantining or isolating. Um, if, if I test positive, will I need to isolate? If I'm identified as a close contact from somebody, even though I've been vaccinated, will I need to quarantine once we're in semester? So if somebody has a positive test, now, just sort of bear in mind that the surveillance tests that Lehigh has done are PCR viral tests, and the symptomatic testing that we do in the health center are also PCR. We are not doing any of the antigen tests, and we're not doing antibody tests as you know, any component of that. If somebody has a positive PCR test under direction and guidance from our local infectious disease specialists and the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Health Bureau, we have to manage every positive PCR test as a case. So whether that person was vaccinated, not vaccinated, vaccination won't give you a false positive PCR test. So 
all positive viral PCR tests are managed as a case at this point. Um, and if somebody's a close contact of a case, that's where it's gonna depend a little bit on whether they were, um, if they had COVID, documented COVID in the last 90 days, they don't need to quarantine. If they have been vaccinated and fully vaccinated, so there's criteria for that, meaning they had both shots of a two shot regimen and they're at least two weeks out from the second shot or they're two weeks out from the uh, single shot, then they're considered fully vaccinated. And as a close contact, they would not need to quarantine. So those are really kind of, a, it's a huge benefit, if you will, of um, being vaccinated is that you would not need to quarantine as a close contact. Current guidance is though, that you would be tested as a close contact. Um, that guidance has actually changed a couple of times over the last month. So I don't know what that might sit at in, August and September, but that's the current guidance. Um, and again, quarantine is isolating somebody who might have been exposed or mm -hmm. who's been exposed, but who might have been infected uh, to separate them from other people so that they don't potentially pass it on to somebody else. So I, I think you mentioned this before. So the vaccines are proving to be highly effective, but nothing to 100%. So even if I'm vaccinated, it doesn't mean I won't get it, nor does it mean I can't transmit it to somebody else. Correct. Okay. So that's why a lot of these, these um, practices are still in place. And so. Yeah, but the vaccines are, you know, current estimates, you know, 90%, well, I should say the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are estimated to be 90 plus percent effective, maybe as high as 95, 96% effective. And 70 plus percent effective at preventing transmission. So not just for, uh, well, and, and infection. So um, it's not just preventing symptoms from showing, but in 70, 75 percent of the cases, it's preventing someone from ever, um, ever testing positive and therefore ever being uh, able to pass on the virus to others. So this is part of the, the benefit of, of widespread vaccination is that it, um, the best available evidence is that it reduces transmission pretty significantly. And this is uh, you know, based on data from Israel, where right now about 60% of the overall population is vaccinated. Um, and, and other you know, uh, sort of real world examples, not just sort of laboratory based examples. So, let me, let me ask this. Um, just to stop, Chris, can I just, just, just to yeah, sum, no, just, just, just really clearly, once again, like it reduces the risk of infection, reduces the risk of serious illness, reduces the risk of potential fatality. And really, when you, when you take a look at all of those things together, you're really talking about really promoting the health and wellness and well-being of the campus broadly and the community when you think about herd immunity as well. So, um and I mean, to, to date, there's been something like 245 million doses given. So this is um, a lot that's been looked at in determining the efficacy and safety as well. Yeah. So in the case that um, somebody does contract COVID-19, often you know, the symptoms don't last a long time and they're not real severe, usually, thank goodness, um, but we still would require somebody to isolate if they're because of that infection risk. Um, does that mean coursework will be interrupted? Does that mean, you know, even though my classes are in person, I'll have the ability to take exams online or watch my class because I'm in that status of isolation or quarantine? This will this will depend a little bit on the class. Um, so you know, this is Hopefully this will this will seem like in the past when yeah, you know, students get sick occasionally and students need to miss class occasionally. Um, and so um, we will will be, I would argue, significantly better off um, now than we were before because we have uh, you know, uh, learned how to how to uh, have uh, robust courses online and, and that we'll, you know, we'll have more technology in the classroom so that there'll be more opportunity to record classes um, for students who are um, you know, sick on a, a particular day. 
So I think we'll be, it'll be similar to the past in that um, you know, there may be sort of individual arrangements that need to be made in order to, for students who are ill to, you know, when are, when are they gonna take the exam? How are they gonna catch up on lectures? All those kinds of things. Um, it'll be you know, sort of managed um, you know, on a case by case basis. I think we have you know, much better uh, resources and much more experience in being able to uh, provide uh, for these kinds of situations than we have in the past. Um, and we know that, you know, that those experiences can be taxing. In fact, you know, we saw, I think we saw in the fall, everybody was kind of scrambling to adapt. But in the spring, we really noticed quite a bit of, of burnout or of mental and emotional exhaustion there, right? What is or what can Lehigh do to help address those um, exhaustion and burnout issues that we are facing this semester? But I think there are um, you know, quite a number of things. I, I mean, we have, um, uh, through the Health and Wellness Center, we have you know, counseling and, and other resources available, and maybe David can talk a bit about that. Um, we also uh, have frequently, over the course of the last couple of semesters, communicated with faculty about the importance of recognizing students' um, you know, anxiety and stress level. Um, I've talked to you know, quite a number of faculty who have uh, you know, done things to try and um, you know, mitigate some of those kinds of concerns. We have, uh, you know, we recognize that this is a, a stressful and difficult time for many people on campus, including students, including you know, staff, including faculty. And that's something that we will continue to look at. Uh, you know, I, I recognize and I've talked to, to both students and also faculty and staff who are concerned and anxious about coming back to campus. Um, and so that is something that we will have to you know, recognize and manage and, and you know, it's hard for me to predict, predict exactly how that's going, what that's going to look like and what that is going to, um, uh, how many people will be concerned and, and exactly what will they be concerned about. Um, but we were certainly aware of and sensitive to those issues um, you know, across the university community. And, and that is something that we are, will provide additional resources and additional support, um, especially for students. Yeah, I think I, in the counseling center, certainly over the course of the last year, and as we think about this upcoming fall, well aware of the really impact over time of, um, from, from, from a lot of different standpoints, actually, for, for students who are positive, who needed to be isolated and concerned and anxiety around that experience and their own health and wellness and well-being, as well as students who were close contact and concerns and anxieties around um, potentially becoming positive and also needing to quarantine for 14 days and the um, really the isolative experience of that, um, <clears throat> as well as just in general, having to manage a year like no other in terms of a university experience and whatever their um, ideas and thoughts about what the year might bring, there were so many unknowns. And I think the fact that, the, that those unknowns continued over the course of the fall and the spring with you know, rates increasing nationally, regionally, locally on our campus, et cetera, and that fluctuation, a lot of unknowns. So I think that it was fatiguing um, for, for all of us. And one of the things that the counseling center spent a lot of time, both in terms of its provision of services, and those services will, of course, be continuing in the fall. So aside from individual work, group work, uh, other programs and workshops that are really designed to work with students to allow them an opportunity to come together and um, express their experiences and difficulties and challenges and stressors and opportunities to develop coping strategies in so many different kinds of ways, I think is one of the things that was really prominent over the course of the last year. And we're anticipating that certainly that there's gonna be anxiety over 
what this upcoming year will bring because it's another year of unknowns of coming out of hopefully the most serious parts of this pandemic and into a year of uh, a return to hopefully close to normalcy. And, but you know, that will bring its own stressors, both negative, but also positive stressors too. And um, the other part too, I would say is the, we have a HAPS office, the Health Advancement Prevention Services Office that also offers lots of activities and uh, for students to allow them the opportunity to connect. And we know that social and emotional connectedness really predicts well-being. Social and emotional connectedness predicts well-being. So we're very mindful of that, both in the counseling center and in the HAPS office in terms of providing opportunities. Now this past year, primarily virtually, um, but as we come out over the last eight weeks, having more in-person activities. And then of course in the fall, expecting a lot more, but aware of the toll that the past year has taken and being mindful of our programs and services that we offer in the fall that um, really um, enhance well-being and um, acknowledge and validate what the experience has been this past year in a way that helps us really, um, all of us reach our potential in this fall in the unknown that that brings, so. And Chris, mm -hmm. I'd also say that, in, well, and we all know wellness, especially mental wellness, that it is the one of the top one or two issues on colleges and, and university campuses around the country and will continue to uh, be the case in the fall. In addition to everything that, that Nathan and David uh, have described by way of, of formal interactions, we, we also know that outreach is important. And that's both from, from staff members, but also from students. And we have a number of peer, ed, peer educators, peer, peer health advisors that, that also uh, participate in this effort and they're important to, to this effort. We, we have very good uh, assessment data and just uh, anecdotal data from students that clearly communicates that some, sometimes they simply want someone to check in on them and ask how they're doing. And we'll absolutely, and we've begun doing, uh, having an intentional effort around that, but we're absolutely going to be making that a priority in the fall. Uh, we know that all students will not find their way, or the majority of students even will not find their way to the counseling center. And uh, most students uh, won't require the services of the counseling center, but a vast majority of our students, again, they've told us they, they appreciate someone simply asking and that someone can be another student, a professor, a Griffin, a, a member of, of our staff and student affairs, but that check-in uh, to see if folks are okay and willing to communicate if they're okay or not. And, and then if they, if they do express a need or, or demonstrate some need, we have uh, a ton of uh, resources and services in place, and we're always ready to connect those students with wellness-related services. Great, Rick. Let me keep you up for just a minute longer. Um, reading the questions coming in, there seems to be some particular uh, anxiety among returning sophomores, last year's freshmen. And you talked a little bit about this already, about the orientation opportunities for them. What advice would you give them, um, not just a new freshmen coming in, but the returning sophomores who really haven't had much of a campus experience. What, give me some advice for them. Sure, get involved. Uh, I, I referenced clubs and organizations earlier. There will be a club and organization fair early in the fall, right around orientation. And we absolutely, and, and we know that students are involved. Like I said, we have more than a couple hundred clubs and organizations on campus. And if students do not uh, see a club or organization to their liking, we will help those students establish a club or organization. We know that friend groups are, are, import, are important and students look for affinity groups on, on campus. Get involved on campus, optimize your experience uh, and their involvement opportunities through their colleges, through student affairs or of their own design, but get involved. Uh, that, that's absolutely uh, key to enjoying the fullness of the university experience. Great, great advice. All right, we're, we're beginning to wind down here. I'm going to see if I can squeeze in a couple more questions um, that, that are coming up here. One, is there a quick definition or clarification you can give us? Um, this might be Sarah, David, on what's the difference between uh, an emergency youth authorization on the vaccines and full FDA approval? Who 
want to take that one? So, I mean, I, I can give a partial answer. Maybe David or Sarah can jump in. So, um, emergency use authorizations are the sort of designation given um, for an approval that is, is made in the context of um, uh, when the FDA views that there are no alternatives to this particular therapy. So, um, in this case, COVID vaccines were in this category because there were no alternative approaches to preventing COVID. And so this was applied for under an EUA, EUA provision. Um, so in this case, there were clinical trials and, and I know the Moderna and, and Pfizer uh, case the best. So there were, there were about 44, 45,000 uh, patients who were part of a clinical trial looking at both efficacy and safety of the Moderna and, and um, uh, Pfizer uh, vaccines. Um, and it was on the basis of that data, which demonstrated between 90 and 95% efficacy and a very low incidence of, um, of adverse outcomes um, that uh, the EUA was granted for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine is actually in the process of, or the Pfizer, the company is being, is in the process of applying for a um, BLA um, which I forget what the acronym stands for, but that's the more standard form of authorization um, for use uh, that just information just came out um, in the last few days that they're in the process of applying for BLA approval. Um, so, so the clinical trial that resulted in or, or you know, resulted in approval of these vaccines under the, under the, EU, under the EUA provision is something that, um, I mean, the, uh, the data were submitted back in December, um, and it was based on, uh, as I said, about 44, 45,000 different cases. In addition, um, ever since then, there has been tracking of adverse outcomes, um, and the, the rate of adverse outcomes, for the, especially for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, has been extremely low. Uh, as I'm sure some of you are aware, the J and J vaccine, um, there was uh, a concern raised, and similarly in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine, there was a concern raised about blood clots. There were um, the, the rate of those blood clots for the J and J vaccine in the U.S. was about uh, was about a one in a million or so um, adverse effect, um, uh, and the which is you know, still much lower than the rate of blood clots for many. Um, uh, many uh, therapies and, and sort of drugs that are used commonly, um, including, uh, including birth control pills. So the rate of, of blood clots for birth control pills was much higher than the rate of blood clots for the J&J vaccine. Um, and, and for um, Moderna and Pfizer, there were no adverse events uh, either from the trials or in the, the vac through the vaccine rollout to, to date, which have resulted in um, you know, stopping or pausing vaccination at any point in this process. Yeah, and I would, I would say that the EUA process is a process to Nathan's point where when there is essentially a public health emergency with some condition that there is not a, a current effective treatment. I mean, we're talking uh, you know, over the in the pandemic, there's been over 500,000 deaths in the United States. So at the, and we were at maybe half of that or so in December when these were approved. So the the vaccines go through the same process. It's just that my understanding is that in the phase three trials, they don't have to have shown as long term um, efficacy or the um, um, you, you know, it's longer term efficacy. They don't have to show as much of that. So, but all the rest of the process is essentially the same. Um, it's just an ability to get it out there for use um, somewhat earlier. So it's not really in an experimental phase. It's not in a phase one. It's not in a preclinical phase. Um, to Nathan's point, there were tens of thousands uh, of people that were enrolled in these trials, um, but there is a very strong component of the EUA that requires the manufacturers 
to do very significant ongoing monitoring of uh, side effects and efficacy. So, you know, I think that should be reassuring to people and to the point that as of yesterday, from what I see on the CDC site, there have been 247 million doses of the vaccines. That's a lot. You know, that affords a lot of opportunity to look at safety data. Um, and I do think it's reassuring to know that with the J&J &J pause, there was a careful look at, you know, what was this um, side effect and to be able to put some guidance out there about populations that maybe other choices, um, you know, they might consider other choices. <clears throat> Okay, we are out of time. Um, but what I heard with a lot of uh, reason for optimism, a lot of great indicators, uh, with some advice that says, uh, get involved, seek out opportunities, look for resources is almost always more available than you realize. So I'll sum it up with that. And thank all of our panelists for participating. We're glad all of you joined in. Uh, remember the recording will be on the uh, COVID information website on the Lehigh website. And we hope that you gained a lot of information out of this and that we'll continue to have great conversations in the future. Thank you very much for joining. Take care of yourselves, we'll see you soon.